Our text today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, beginning with verse 51. Jesus is talking. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, they will live forever. And the bread which I shall give is my flesh, given for the life of the world. This caused a squabble among the Judeans. How can this fellow give us his flesh to eat? I'm telling you the solemn truth, Jesus replied. If you don't eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. My flesh is true food, you see, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I remain in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It isn't like the bread which the ancestors ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said this in the synagogue while he was teaching in Capernaum. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Will you join me in our prayer from Richard of Chichester? Thanks be to thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits thou hast given me, for all the pains and insults thou hast borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly day by day. Amen. In John's account of the crucifixion, we're told that as it drew closer to sunset and the Sabbath, the religious leaders wanted the legs of the three crucified men broken, and then that would hasten death, and then they could be taken down before sunset. Breaking the legs of the crucified men made it impossible for them to rise high enough on the cross to draw breath. It could take a long time for a person to die on the cross, much longer than the agonizing three hours these men experienced. Some victims could last for days, not only tortured by the excruciating pain, but also tormented by insects, birds, and depending on where they were crucified, wild animals. The soldiers went out and broke the legs of the first two victims. But when they came to Jesus, they were surprised to see that he was already dead. They didn't break his legs, but a soldier thrust his spear into Jesus' side, and out from that side came blood and water. That resulted in the soldiers going to the cross. John says that the soldiers found those first two. And after they had died, they took them down. And after they had taken Jesus down, there was that detail about the blood and water. It's an interesting detail for John to record, for we know that John never wastes a single word. Like a good poet, he chooses his words and phrases carefully. What is John saying when he talks about blood and water flowing from Jesus' side? If you read the previous 19-plus chapters of John, you know that water and blood do not stand just for water and blood. Water and blood in John point to the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. So what is John saying when blood and water pour out of Jesus' side on the cross? Fred Craddock said that John was telling us that the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion find their meaning in the death of Jesus. And they have no meaning apart from the death of Jesus. 
The Apostle Paul would embrace that interpretation. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, he writes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. The sacraments of Holy Communion and Baptism find their meaning in the death, death of Jesus. And that helps us better understand what Jesus was saying in our scripture this morning. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. The bread I shall give is my flesh given for the life of the world. Now, John's gospel was written probably in the latter 90s. They probably had had access to at least one of the other gospels, most likely the gospel of Luke. And as a church all, if not most of them, were already baptized and had been receiving communion for decades. They would have been as familiar as members of Paul's many congregations with the prescribed liturgy and actions of the presider at the table. They would have seen the presider raise probably the unleavened bread high for all to see. They would have watched as the presider broke the bread and recalled how Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Each one of them would have received a piece of that bread torn off and handed to them by the presider, and then they would have all eaten it together. Then the presider would have taken a cup filled with red wine and held it up and declared in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then the cup would have passed from person to person, each one taking a sip. Unlike the crowd who first heard Jesus' words about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, the people of John's congregation, like us, would have had a context for understanding Jesus' words. We know that Jesus is not talking about cannibalism. We know that he's not suggesting that Christians actually drink blood when he uses words like flesh, which is different from the liturgical term body. Flesh refers, of course, to the human body, not glorified in art like Michelangelo's David, but the human body in all its vulnerability, the mortal body, broken like a body perhaps beaten with a whip, a body whose arms would have been pulled out of socket from hanging on a cross, whose soldiers are bruised from carrying a heavy cross through the winding streets of Jerusalem, a body whose wrists and ankles are scarred and bloodied by the wounds of nails. When we receive Holy Communion, we witness a replay of the crucifixion. Christ's body is broken and given for us. And symbolically, we become one with Christ when we take communion. And as we take that bread and drink that wine, Christ strengthens us, Christ heals us, Christ empowers us, Christ forgives us, and sends us back into the world in the strength of his Spirit. There's so much grace served at communion. And that's another reason why we United Methodists practice an open table. We don't want to get in the way of God's love. We don't want to put up any barriers to Christ coming to you. I mean, did you hear the grace in the first verse of today's text? I am the living bread which came down from heaven. When some Russian cosmonauts returned to Earth from one of their early space flights, they bragged that they had searched the heavens and had seen no sign of God. And when Robert Kennedy heard this, he said, I suggest that they, like the rest of humanity, set their sights a little higher. But the good news for us is we don't have to go to outer space to meet God. 
Not that anybody would be able to. As, as we know, those people who tried to make foolish attempts to reach up to God, like those who built the Tower of Babel, they failed miserably. Because we don't have to reach up to God. God in Christ reaches down to us. In Jesus, we hear those words, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And perhaps we could add to that sentence, because you could never reach us. Jesus doesn't build walls. Jesus tears walls down. He covers the distance between ourselves and him. As we saw last week, he wants to be in relationship with us, not just acquaintances, nodding acquaintances. He wants a friendship. One of the things I love about the Pray As You Go podcast is how their guided prayers leave so much space for Jesus and me to talk. Often as the podcast comes to an end, the narrator will say, now in the time that's left, talk to Jesus as you would a friend. And then there are several minutes of music and an opportunity to actually have that kind of a conversation. That's what Christ wants. He went to the cross for us. And I've heard it said that if only one person had needed the cross, Jesus would have gone to the cross anyway. That's how much he loves each one of us. His death enables us to have eternal life. Which, by the way, you can begin experiencing now. You don't have to wait for heaven. I got a very dra dramatic example of that when I was the associate pastor at another church. We had a man who was a Dallas police officer who loved Holy Communion. It was his favorite thing. And the only thing he loved better was serving communion. And so very often at the end of the 830 service, the pastor would look out among the congregation for somebody to help serve, and he would say, Ray, would you and Sue please come forward and help us with communion? And Ray would come up with the biggest grin. Ray got a real bad cancer. And he was really struggling. But he had treatment, and we got word that the treatment seemed to have worked and that the cancer had gone into remission, and they couldn't find any, any sign of it. The surgeries had worked. And it was the following Sunday, and I remember as sitting there as the associate, like Pastor Anne Marie, hanging on the pastor's every word, I thought to myself, oh, Harvey, I wish you would ask Ray to come help serve communion. And sure enough, Harvey did. Harvey had Ray and Sue come forward, and that was a joyous celebration, knowing Ray's story as he handed out, as he went by with the cup for each, to each person. But you know, as so often happens, cancer doesn't always stay away. And after several months, we found out that the cancer had returned. And coincidentally, it happened the week before we had Communion Sunday. And as I was sitting there and Harvey was making the invitation, I thought, I wonder if Ray would even want to come up today, having received that news this week. Harvey invited Ray and Sue to come forward. And Ray followed me as I went down the aisle with, uh, across the altar with the bread. He was right there with the cup. The, I'd say the body of Christ broken for you. He'd say the blood of Christ shed for you. And after we made the first round, we were standing outside waiting for the next group to come and kneel. And Ray, having just heard that the cancer was bad, leaned over to me and said, doesn't this make you feel good? That's what Jesus means when he talks about you experience eternal life 
now. Whatever our circumstances, Jesus rises up and we get a taste of that eternity, a taste of heaven. And it's enough to see us through even the worst that life can throw at us. Kevin Saunders, a Christian writer from Phoenix, Arizona, writes a Lexio Divina devotional every week. And in this week's devotional, he offers a prayer that captures what it means to feast on the bread of life. I invite you to bow your heads as I share that prayer with you. When the journey of life is long and we hunger and thirst, bread of life, sustain us. When the road is hard and our bodies weak, bread of life, heal us. When our spirits are low and we can't carry on, bread of life, revive us. When the challenge is great and the workers are few, bread of life, empower us. And when the victory's won and we see your face, Bread of life, you will rejoice with us. Amen.